This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. He's Greg, I'm Nick. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today. Use that promo code for us, CLNS, for a first deposit match up to $100. And of course, as we always say, do us a favor. If you like the pod, you want to support it, go over to Prize Picks and sign up using that code CLNS. All right, Greg, earlier today, Elliot Wolf met with the media, his pre-draft press conference. Before I ask you a question, I know you and I have to be on the same page with this. I, I, I urge the Patriots to use a microphone to each media member that is in that room when they have a question. Because, Greg, I will give you credit. You are one of the only cats in that room that I could hear today watching this thing. You, you, you have enough bass in the voice, and you, and you, up, you up the ante. A lot of people, they're whispering and everything. Hello. So can we please get a microphone to the media? Yeah, I mean, just, I, uh, I got to tell you, Nick, um, oh. yeah, I got to tell you that, um, you know, they moved us into new media room digs, I want to say about a year ago. And, um, you know, it's great um, for the most part. I will tell you, like those press conference settings, and I, I, I've been trying to think of like what they can do to alleviate it. I mean, you know, first of all, they need to they need to bump up the the microphone um, level, like even just for the speaker, like Elliot Wolf today, like in the room, because like I'm trying to record and like, I have this transcription thing uh, app called Otter that I use. And like, it's hard to pick up in there. And, um, and I, I, you weren't the only media member that like texted me like, Hey, what was this question about? Like, what, what, what was this answer in response to? And like, even in that room, like, if you're not one of the eager beavers, and let's just uh, state it out, I am not one of the early risers, early arrivers for anything. <laughs> okay, that's just look, I am who I am. Okay, and I'm 50 now, and it ain't changing. But you know, so I'm not one of these guys. Giardi, I will say, Giardi, when he when he's there, he wasn't there today because he's he's off doing college visits with the family. But Giardi is one of these like he's in the front row, like you know he's. He, he's an early riser. He's an early bird. But like it's it's even it's hard not only to hear the questions, but to like hear, you know, for them to see you to get like within the like it's it's tough. But I agree. I think I think a good first step would be and like, like let's just, you know, because you have different levels like Tom Curran's up on the t- front left i'm in the back right phil perry's in the front with next to reese and like when those guys ask questions like i can't even hear their questions and i'm in the room and so we might as well go to like sort of the post game press conference where it's like raise your hand we'll give you the microphone type of thing because i think it would be more productive for everybody yeah so hopefully stacy james i know that's probably not his department um but the audio technical people there we can we can fix this. All right. Can we also first acknowledge this about Wolf? His job today, Greg, is not to tell the truth, correct? Yeah, I think um, it's fair to say after his 20 minutes after talking with us that um, I think he viewed his job as um, clouding as much as possible the Patriots' interest and also um, opening everything up for a trade that somebody might um, you know, that, that somebody might want to come up and trade because they're not sure what direction the Patriots are going to go in. Is it Daniels? Is it May? Is it JJ McCarthy? Are they going to trade down? Like, what are they, is somebody going to jump and go to the Patriots and take the quarterback that they want? So, yeah, I, I, um, you know, I, I will say, you know, having known Elliot over the years, um, I, I don't think he is, he's somebody that, in his answers that you think he might be deceptive. I think there's a lot of truth in it. Like he doesn't like to straight out lie, but I do think that Elliot, um, I've been very impressed with the, um, the confidence that he has operated in. It seems like as we get closer to the day of draft day, and maybe it's because like a lot of the haze in the barn at this point. And he even talked about that. They've gone through the different scenarios that they pretty much know what they're going to do at three, depending on what Washington does. 
Like, I think he's extremely confident in his plan, their scouting, their preparedness for this draft um, going forward. All right, so let's run through some of the questions I had for you after this press conference. And then we've got some uh, Bedard thoughts off of some of the reporting that he's done or is in the middle of doing. Let's first start with this. Decision makers jumped out to me uh, that Wolf said it's going to be him, Gerard Mayo, Matt Groh, and then depending on which prospect they're talking about, offense, defense, the coordinators will also get involved. Does that make sense to you? Yes, in, in in a sense. I think that with the coordinators being involved, I think that's um, you know, probably probably after the first day, more of a second and third day thing where um they might be getting close on a pick. Hey, here's what we're thinking about these guys, like, you know, which one do you prefer? Which one do you need? Like, say, you know, we're talking about Alex Van Pelt in the offense. Like, say, hey, these are the guys that we have highest rated on the board. We're coming up in five picks. Like, which guy do you think that we need that would be the most help for you right away? I don't think that that will be – certainly those conversations are going to take place in the lead-up here to the draft about three, possibly trading up from 34 or sticking at 34. Um, but, uh, yeah, I it, it does make sense to me. No mention of the crafts. Was that intentional or we're really just looking at the crafts being involved that they are involved in this decision-making process only at pick three and really nothing else. I think, and this is just my impression. Nobody's told me this. My impression is that, especially in light of recent news that we will um, get to later. And this also goes along with, remember about the, the published reports that came out right before Gerard Mayo was named head coach and about Jonathan Kraft's influence and all that. And all of a sudden, Jonathan Kraft went from being announced to being on the dais with his dad and Gerard Mayo to him not being there and having too much business to take care of um, yep. with with Kraft World. And so I think my read on it, Nick, was that they, there's a concerted effort to keep them out of much of anything, much discussion about the draft, the team, um, personnel things like that. I think there's a concerted effort going on to uh, keep keep the crafts out of it. So, got a question about an offensive player. Sorry, I got thrown off because I just saw uh, that account, ML Football, which oh, tweets God. a lot of stuff out there. Um, AJ Brown has started to follow Jacoby Brissett and KJ Osborne <laughs> on... Uh, on Instagram. So there you go. Uh, but when it comes to an offensive player, obviously Mayo has a large voice in the room. But if it's an offensive player, you bring in Alex Van Pelt. Does Mayo kind of acquiesce to Van Pelt and say, hey, that's your world? Or the head coach can can step over the, the offensive coordinator in that situation and say, look, I understand what you're saying, Alex, but uh, I'm the guy who's running the program. I lean more towards this guy, so that's where we're going. I think Gerard Mayo will do a good job of listening to people and um, soliciting information. But at the end of the day, I think Gerard Mayo, and this could end up being his detriment as as Patriots head coach, at least early on in his career. Um, I think he has a steadfast belief in his own opinions and his own how do I want to put this, his own uh, ability to do the job, his own performance level. So I think he might say the right things, but I think really in his mind, he's thinking that's okay. I know what I'm doing. I've been waiting for this. Um, I I could have been a head coach five years ago. As soon as I got into the league, I'm ready to do this. I'm making, this is my vision for the football team. So what you're saying, Greg, is that Gerard Mayo is a very confident fellow. Yes. I would say that, and I would say the same thing about um, Elliot Wolf. Like I said earlier, like you know, one of my early impressions of Elliot, not only today, but I've seen him in some other settings. You know, from um, you know the combine to you know some other things. Um, he he has this look on his face like um, the cat that caught the canary. Like he uh, he's 
He's ready. I think both of these guys, I think they feel like they're ready for this and they think that they are going to knock it out of the park. Now, um, often reality in the NFL is much different, so we'll have to see. All right, so Wolf said he feels that the current roster could support a rookie quarterback during the press conference. Do you agree with that? I don't disagree with that. Um, totally. Now, look, um, let's be honest. The the left tackle position, at least, is a huge gaping void on this team. And we we heard him say that if the, st- the season started today, it would be a core four at left tackle, and they think he can do a representative yep. job. Um, you know, but I, I agree with his assessment and I think we've talked about it sort of over the course of the off season, you know, when a bunch of other people are throwing temper tantrums about the Patriots, like lack of moves and, and, you know, um, not burning cash and not doing trades that, oh, the Patriots could have done that. Why did they do that? Um, I think that, and I only feel better about my opinion that, you know, Elliot Wolf looked at this and probably Gerard Mayo and, and said this is not a this was not a four win team that there are a lot of good pieces on this team and you know when you talk about a really good defense that's going to get Gonzalez back that's going to get Matthew Judon back in in you know in most respects um, I assume they're going to do something about his contract at some point in time I think that and then you know the offensive line is is representative I think the the weapons are representative I think getting Hunter Henry back was big. Um, they're going to have a professional quarterback, whether that's Brissett or somebody else, uh, the third overall pick, if they're ready to go. They have a good running game. Like I, I agree with him. I don't think this is like a. It's a complete. You know, a lot of people just look at last year and they're just like, oh well. You know, they're just gonna. They haven't really changed much, so they're gonna suck again. I just, I don't believe that. And here's another big thing, Nick, is, um, and I didn't really realize this till somebody pointed this out to me recently, that. In the last five years, the Patriots have had five different offensive line coaches in in, in all essence. And, you know, from Jeez. from Scar to um, the guy who went with McDaniels. I forget what his name is. Um, what, Brasillo? Yeah, Carm Brasillo. Brasillo, Rattillo. Yeah. Or... <laughs> and then, you know, and then to Matt Patricia and Billy Yates and then Clem to – Whatever the hell they had last year, like, you know, again, people know how I feel about offensive lines. And just, like, if if Peters and Kugler, the two offensive line coaches, are legit, um, that can make a, a, a huge improvement on this team. So, in general, like, is it perfect? No. Do I think it's going to be a train wreck for a rookie quarterback? No, I don't. Wolf said he feels people are underestimating the tackle spot and wide receiver spot as far as the guys they have on this team. Do do you think we're underestimating them, or do you think that Wolf's point today, because he kept saying we have NFL players, is just, look, these guys can play. They, they might not be great. They might not be top tier, and we'll get to the receiver thing in a minute. But do you think it was you know proper for, for Wolf to say, because I think it was Karen Garigian who asked him, if people are underestimating what they have. And he said, yes, I thought I, the first thing I thought of when he said, like we have NFL receivers and we have NFL uh, tight ends and NFL running backs. I just thought of Bill Belichick saying like Mac Jones can play quarterback in the NFL. Like uh, it was, um, but (laughs) like, that's just me being the cynic and being an a-hole. That's all, that's all I could think of. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think Wolf is correct. Is it top line? No. Is it a disaster? No. But I think that I think that you know they view Hunter Henry as like the top ten type top tight end that was available. They view Michael Winning as the top right tackle that was available. They brought him back. Ramondre Stevenson will probably get an, uh, an extension at some point. He's really good. They really feel really good about uh, Antonio Gibson. There's a lot to sort out at the two guards and obviously left tackle. And but I just think. I think in their mind, if they get a quarterback at three, they get an offensive tackle at some point. And I don't know about you, Nick, but the discussion today about trading for a wide receiver, um, 
It sure sounds, seems like you asked me, I think, last podcast what my percentage was on them trading for a wide receiver at some point, probably likely after the draft, so you can get into future picks trading those instead of this year. And I said 52%. I might be up to 58 59%. Um, so, you know, <laughs> things. I think they're confident that things are going to lo- look a lot different in about a month or two. We talked about a little bit, a core for the left tackle. You know, he said if the season started today and he made a joke that he, he always kind of picks on people who say that if the if the season started today because it doesn't start today. I, I think we'll get a real feel about their offensive line during the draft and whether or not they believe a core for could be that that starting left tackle. But I want to move on to receiver. He, he said this a couple things before we get to the wide receiver trade. And, and what he specifically said, you just kind of hinted towards it. But first, he was asked about the X role. And uh, he said, I think we have players that can line up and play at X. Do we have players that on a three-by-one beat the backside coverage every single time? I'm not sure we have that just yet. But we certainly have good receivers. And then he got he went on to say, you know, Osborne could play all three positions. Yep. Your read on that answer. Um, I thought it was hugely accurate. Um, and I'm pretty sure I saw Evan Lazar probably um, pass out from the discussion about three by one sets <laughs> and, and and all that stuff. Um, I think I, I think I had to wake up Evan um, after that. He might have blacked out. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean that it just shows you that you know Elliot's not an idiot and like he 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 wants to provide information. I think that's hugely accurate. I mean, you look at it and you if, if the Patriots go out there with you know, one back and four wide receivers. I think between Osborne, Pop, and Kendrick Bourne, should he be healthy, those are three pretty good options. Um, and, you know, none of them are top line or anything like that. But all of a sudden, at the boundary, if you get like, uh, who was the guy you just mentioned about the ML football? A.J. Brown. You get A.J. Brown or Cortland Sutton or somebody like that, and then you, you draft a, a guy to develop to be like sort of the next guy or to take the place of somebody else in that three-man group, all of a sudden the Patriots look a lot different. And, you know, if you're asking me right now, I think that's the plan. Now, as far as the pursuing a wide receiver via trade, he said, we've had conversation with teams about different scenarios, not just at wide receiver but other positions. It's something we'd be open to. So, again, you, you felt a little bit more confident in them going after a veteran wide receiver after today. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, and, and I've sort of been there. I've been ridiculed for it, you know, even though, you know, every few off, I still, you know, whether it was the onset of free agency or a trade, like I've been pretty steadfast that I believe at some point the Patriots will trade for a number one wide receiver. And it's not just things that I've heard. And this is where I sort of punch back at Felger where, when he's saying like, you know, he does his finger wag thing where he's just like, they're never going to pay for a number one wide receiver. Like, and I'm just like, dude, they just offered Calvin Ridley $22 million a year. And he's not even a number one wide receiver. Like, what are you, what are you talking about? So like their, their pursuit of Calvin Ridley should be a big billboard to everybody that says they looked at their roster. They looked what's in the draft and they said the, the quickest way for us to get competitive is to bring in a dangerous outside receiver that sort of makes everything better. And it's, it's not to say you can't get in in the draft. Um, certainly. You know, if you draft one at three, you're getting one. Uh, but um, that, you know, they, I think they are on the prowl for that and they are waiting and they are laying in wait and have been, you know, look, they $22 million for Calvin Ridley. He didn't take it for whatever reason. And now I think they're like, okay, well, now the price tag might come down on some people after the draft when, when other draft receivers are in these programs and things like that. And I think they are ready to pounce if they can. I'm so glad you said that thing about Ridley. Cause I've said that same thing to myself watching certain uh, programming over the last couple of weeks. I want to put my head through a Seriously. wall. I'm like, did they not just offer that? Did they not just offer Ridley $40 million guaranteed? Did I, did I dream that? Was that something that actually happened in reality? I also enjoyed, uh, 
Elliot Wolves answer today when he was asked what happened with Ridley. He's like, uh, yeah, another team offered more money. <laughs> he was like, that's a short, short but sweet. He didn't go into the girlfriend thing or or wife thing like Robert did. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than three million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less in two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the playoff action and win up to a hundred times your money on Prize Picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball and hockey's postseason, which is coming up. I can't wait. I know Nick is going to be freaking <laughs> geeked up for all that stuff. That's for sure. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into 1000 with basketball, hockey, baseball entries today on prize pick, America's number one fantasy sports app. This week on prize picks, I'm selecting Jalen Brown for more than 25 points, David Pasternak for two goals or more, Tyler, O'Ne- Tyler O'Neal, the big thumper for two-plus home runs this week, and Kenley Jansen for two saves. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy at Prize Picks. Let's get to some of your uh, thoughts, Greg, out of some reporting that you've done, and you're in the middle of reporting stuff, of course, as we're now about a week away from the draft. What are the chances that a team will offer a trade that you think would make the Pats move off of the three spot? Not very good, and I don't think that the Patriots expect one. I think they are going full bore ahead um, with the thought that they are going to stick at three. Um, they've already gamed the situations where if the if the commanders take Jaden Daniels, if the commanders take Drake May, if they take J.J. McCarthy, what are we going to do? I, the, the feeling is, and, th- and I also got this talking to some you know, other NFL executives, that they just think that um, they're too, the Patriots at three, that's too high for people to, and again, this goes back to, you know, when you have three or four or five quarterbacks that that could go in the top ten, um, there's a premium on those picks that you have to get those teams out of the spot. So it's not only just number three; it's number three plus the t- the tax that it's going to be a quarterback that you know, for a quarterback needy team to move out of a spot where they can get a quarterback. Um, that there's, I think the feeling is that there's very little chance that somebody's going to offer them is going to blow them away, which is what they're going to have to do to move into that spot. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to dive deeper if we can. The Patriots, do they already know who they're picking depending on what Washington does at two? My sense is, and I think Elliot Wolf answered it where he's, I forget the way he answered it, but he basically said like, I think it was asked, like, where are you guys, like, on the – to your final decision on the quarterback. He said, we're not um, quite there yet, but soon. Um, from what I understand, they know what they're doing, that they have – it's it's not that difficult. I mean, because you know Caleb Williams is going one, and now it's just a process right. of elimination where you're just like – you know, I, I think that, you know – it might not completely be done because, you know, they just got done with 30 visits and, you know, now they put Penix on the, you brought them in as well, but, you know, they just had, you know, Daniels and McCarthy in recently. They had May in. So now probably in the past couple of days or in the next couple of days, you know, they form formally, you know, do it. But I think in terms of, do I think Elliot Wolf knows what he's going to do or what he wants to do at three? Yeah, I think he knows. He also said today he'd feel comfortable picking any of the top quarterbacks at three. Do you believe him? I do not. No. I think this is more what you you sort of open the show with. I think this is more sort of lying, clouding judgment, like all that stuff. I think, and this also goes to the column that I wrote over the weekend where, you know, the person that I talked to um, said like you don't go into the draft saying like, you know, there's five or six, five or six guys that we'd be happy with. Like, I don't, right. I don't think that's the case at all. I think, 
you know, it's a it's a it's a three person board for them with Williams, and then and then how does it go? And and then if I think they they'd be happy with, in my opinion, I think they'd be happy with Daniels or May, and I think it would be on their board. It would be Daniels and then May, and then uh, if for some reason uh, they're not there, they might be you know, into like a Penix or something like that. If somebody does come up and offer them a ridiculous package for number three, um, then I think they have that guy in mind who, who, who they would want perhaps trade back up and, and that sort of thing. Like we talked about in the last podcast. Um, but no, I don't believe, well, I mean, I don't believe his, his talk about the five or six quarterbacks. Like I do think that they, they have a, three por- person board and they're confident in that some of the smoke around jj mccarthy has been dying down the last few days is he still in the conversation you think at number three i'll put it this way i can't tell you if he's if it's le- if he's legitimately legitimately in the mix for the patriots at number three but i'll say that the patriots want us to believe that he is in the mix for number three And again, this is, this is sort of where I was when, you know, Tom Curran, Michael Hawley, Chris Gasper, who's back to almost all of them have backtracked, you know, um, Scott Zolak, you know, all these people who, um, pretty have pretty strong connections to people in the Patriot organization all of a sudden came out at the same time. And they're just like, JJ McCarthy is like in play. And now they're backtracking a little bit. Like I said, uh, I've been told it's legitimate. I don't know whether to believe it's legitimate. Why would they want people to believe that they're really interested in in McCarthy? Is it trying to build the value of the three pick? Because just in case their guy goes number two, is it because they want to try to make Washington believe that McCarthy is a little bit better than he really Mm. is and, and maybe get Washington to bite? Why would you do that, Greg? What do you think? It, I I think it's I think it's all of the above, but I do think they're just maybe I think they know somebody, whether it's Minnesota or the Giants, um, Denver. I don't know. I think they believe that some teams love JJ McCarthy. Like, and I think we've heard some reporting on this from some national guys that you know JJ McCarthy is like number one on the board of some teams. And I think that they are trying to uh, draw those people out, um, smoke them out to come up for the three pick. And so they are, they are talking up JJ McCarthy big time uh, at one Patriot place. And again, I don't know whether it's legitimate or not. Are they looking for great or are they looking for just good enough at three? I, I thought that they are looking for great that um, which, you know, is part of the reason has led me to they need to go Drake May. If Washington goes Jaden Daniels, go Drake May because the the upside to Drake May is is immense. And, you know, you're talking um, probably a little bit a notch below Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, like that type of guy. Um, whereas, you know, J.J. McCarthy, I think his ceiling is, I don't know, Kirk Cousins, you know, something like that. And, but from what somebody explained to me the other day was that the NFL has changed a little bit. And I'll be interested to to hear what you have to say about this, Nick, and whether you believe this as well. Um, That the NFL has changed a bit from, let's say, Ron Wolf's day, you know, when, you know, it was Brett Favre, it was, um, you know, it was, you know, Joe Montana, you know, it was the, the NFL was ruled by great quarterbacks. Um, there is now a belief and, and, you know, you could possibly look at some teams like San Francisco and other teams that, um, that you can, you can win in today's NFL, as opposed to yesteryear with a good quarterback. I don't subscribe to that. Um, I don't know how you feel about it. 
I think you can win with a good quarterback if everything else is built very, very well. Mm-hmm. You you need to hit on a bunch of different players a bunch of different ways like San Francisco has. I mean, if you can hit on a George Kittle in the in the fifth round and a and a Warner and a number of the guys that they have that they have hit on in the draft, then yeah, I mean it, it makes sense. You have to draft unbelievably well for the most part. You've got to hit on the Debo Samuels. You've got to hit on the Brandon Ayuks. And and look, San Francisco did swing and miss on some big picks. Okay, Trey Lance, number one. But you have to hit on a lot of different areas to to have that kind of team. But I would also say this, Greg. Even if you do that, the path to a championship is still much easier with great at quarterback, not good enough. And we just saw that play Mm -hmm. out in the most recent Super Bowl. We just saw that in February. Brock Purdy, it's not that they lost the game because of Brock Purdy, but Purdy could not win the game for the 49ers. And the Chiefs played like crap for three quarters. Mahomes turns it on, and they end up winning that game. That's because of Mahomes' greatness. You go back to the first time it was San Francisco, Kansas City. San Francisco couldn't shut the door because Jimmy Garoppolo missed a throw in the fourth quarter to a guy who was wide-ass open going downfield. That would have been six. So, again, it wasn't that Jimmy necessarily lost the game for them, but he did not win the game for them. He gave them enough of a margin for Patrick Mahomes to slide in with his greatness and win. So if you talk about competing, if you talk about making the playoffs, and if, if everything goes right, yes but we're talking about margin of error for me. And when you have greatness at that position, the margin for error is so much wider and larger for that football team. I I completely agree with you, especially when you look at it as, you know, in the context of just the AFC. I mean, you know, provided Aaron Rodgers is healthy this year, like you're going to have to beat just in your own division, Aaron Rodgers and Josh Allen. And, you you know you can't do that with a i mean you need like you said you need like a wagon like the San Francisco 49ers around Brock Purdy to even have a chance to compete you also have to go through you know Burrow and you have to go through Mahomes and you're probably going to have to go through Justin Herbert with Jim Harbaugh now and you know just to me an illustration of that is yeah hey, yeah it's it's okay you can do that in theory look at the dolphins in Tua, like, you know, what's if they're going to try to break through here and get to an AFC championship game, let alone a Super Bowl, like you're going to need to put Tua to play lights out against Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, like all these people. And do you really think Tua can do that? I don't. It's also about consistently contending, right? Like, so much has to go your way to win a Super Bowl with a quarterback like that because you have to face the greatness that Greg just brought up. Consistently contending, that's very difficult to pull off. The easiest way to consistently be in the conversation, the top four or five teams, is having one of the best quarterbacks in the league. So I just, yeah, I would disagree with that idea uh, for all of those reasons. What have you heard about a possible Patriots misinformation campaign? I think I, I think we're in the midst of it. I think that, um, you know, from what I understand, the Patriots um, are very happy that no one has any idea what they're going to do at number three. I, mean, I think, and so to me, that has been part of a plan. You know, how much is Gerard Mayo involved? How much was he involved at the league meetings? How much is he involved behind the scenes now with sort of his media connections and stuff like that. I think it's, I think it's real. And we, we really have no frame of reference with this. We have zero frame of reference with this new crew with Mayo and, and Wolf, Um, you know, and so we're not really going to know anything, how much was BS, how much was smoke, how much was real until the draft's over. And, you know, we can see what they did. I go back to, are there any common themes over the last several weeks going back to the combine? And to me, it's been really, really quiet around Drake May since the combine. Immediately following the combine, it was, oh, he impressed them a lot. You know, oh, he he was very impressive in those interviews. And then things just went quiet for the most part around May. I'm not talking about, you know, people mocking Drake May to the Patriots at three, like many, 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 many have. I'm talking about reports of they love the guy, May's the pick. I just, I get the feeling, 
I'll, I'm going to stand by this until next week, unless something crazy pops up. I just, I get the feeling the McCarthy smoke was all trying to, you know, make sure and solidify Drake may sitting there at three. I, I think May's their guy. I really, I, I think Drake may's their guy and I could be dead ass wrong, but there's just so much has been said. You had that weird Daniels thing. He wants to play in new England and not Washington report come out. J- just seems like in McCarthy, it was just nonstop McCarthy for two or three weeks. Just feels like it's made of me. All right, we got a, a couple more things to hit before we say goodbye this week. This episode, though, before we get to those, brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today. Use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. Also, check out Greg, Mike Giardi, and company at BSJ. 50 bucks for the year. And now you got the Bruins. Sounds like it's going to be Saturday night against Toronto. You've got the Celtics on Sunday afternoon. Corrales will be, you know, covering those guys. So a lot going on. Red Sox keep playing David Hamilton at shortstop for some reason. A lot is going on. All right, let's get to uh, let's get to this ESPN report that came out. Everybody was talking about it yesterday. Another Bill Belichick column. I, I just want before we get into the Robert Kraft piece because I, I saw you write about Crafty yesterday. L- little critical, little critical of the owner. But before we get to that, Greg, just kind of big picture thoughts from the story. And and let me just first set it up here. We're talking about Jeremy Fowler. We're talking about Van Nata. We're talking about Wickersham. Those are three of the most legitimate, well-sourced journalists that ESPN has on their payroll. So those were the three guys who wrote this. Just your your big picture, 30,000-foot view of that story. Yeah, first of all, I was a little bit surprised that Fowler got a byline on this. This isn't nor- isn't normally his bag, but he must have gotten some good information that was part of the article. Because I put Seth and Don um, in a separate category. I mean, they're just, and I think even Jeremy would admit that. I mean, those guys are just, um, they're tremendous. I had uh, dinner with them at um, the league meetings, and uh, it sure was a good time. Of course, they didn't even hint to me that they were working on this. So thanks for that, guys. But um, <laughs> uh, so basically, you know, my my overarching opinion was um, some of the specifics was fantastic in this in this article. But I do think a lot of this just basically like confirmed a lot of um like what I've reported, what we've talked about here on the podcast that, you know, I thought that, you know, Belichick, I was told Belichick thought he had the Falcons job in the bag. Um, If not, when he was, when he had that press conference, the day of the press conference with Robert Kraft, but pretty soon thereafter that he thought that was wrapped up. He was in a good space. And I think, uh, I think he was shocked that he didn't get the job. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the the reasoning behind some of the other teams not pursuing Belichick uh, was interesting um, and laughable, uh, especially like Carolina Panthers, um, you know, how Dave Tepper likes to question his head coach with analytics and didn't think he would be able to do that with Belichick. Um, I found it fascinating that Magic Johnson was beating the drum for Belichick <laughs> with the commanders. Yeah. Um, I think that's a that's a nice compliment for Bill, considering you know the head coaches Pat Riley uh, and others that Magic has been around, um, and he knows greatness, of course, and he knows what it takes to win a championship, and sometimes that can be an a hole head coach, and so I thought that was a feather in Bill's cap, um, man. But of course, you know the the biggest bombshell was that, and and let's also point out that the the Patriots through Stacey James strenu- strenuously objected to the characterization, characterization, I can't speak suddenly, that um, that Robert Kraft basically torpedoed Bill's chances at getting the Falcons job because he talked crap about him to Brad Blank. And, um, you know, and the, the other thing I wanted to point out that also backed up our, our reporting is that I, I've been saying all along that keep an eye on Bill to the Eagles after the season. It basically sounds like it's Eagles or Cowboys or bust um, for Bill. But, you know, of course, the the craft, the craft stuff was the most explosive in the story. A couple things from uh, Stacey James before we, we talk about craft. I do love the he steadfastly denies. 
Robert steadfastly denies. He doesn't just deny it. He steadfastly denies it, okay? So that that's a little extra emphasis. Put that in your pipe and oh, smoke it. I, I steadfastly <laughs> uh, deny? Is that how it works? <laughs> and then the other part, though, too. It's so funny because Stacy's like, well, did he – did Kraft – Order the code red on Belichick in January? No, he didn't. But I will acknowledge that he might have done so before January. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, okay. So so maybe the phone, the specific phone calls that we're talking about steadfastly deny. But, hey, man, before January, he also said that Kraft had no recollection of doing that, which is I misremembered or I can't remember, I don't recall when you say that, my my shit detectors pop up immediately. I, I don't, you know, I have no recollection of it. Oh, so you could have done it. You just don't recollect it. And then, well, he didn't do it when, when they're saying he did it. But, hey, James did acknowledge Kraft might have done so prior to January. So maybe right before Christmas, Kraft ordered the code red. Yeah. But it wasn't It wasn't in January, damn it. That, that was, that, that'd be like me if, like, you, you came to me and it's like, Greg, were you talking crap about me and my performance on the podcast? Well, um, maybe during the season, I might have been frustrated with you and might have voiced that, but I can't really remember if I did that. So, yeah, I don't know. It, it just it brought me back to Tom Curran when he said, you know, after the Colts game, the Crafts had made up their mind. Like I could see, I, I could visualize Kraft on the phone during the week talking to Arthur Blank at some point, being like. I'm sick of this guy. This guy doesn't, I don't trust him. He sucks. I'm done with him. But he didn't say it in January, but he couldn't go back on his word because Blank was like, I remember what you said during the season, Robert, when you were pissed. Is that true? Mm-hmm. I would also say this before we get to Kraft. How about the assistant coaches catching strays? The line in there that Belichick told Blank that they're more soldiers than generals. If you're If you're like Matt Patricia or Josh McDaniels and you read that, you're like, Bill. What the hell, man? Why are you throwing me under the bus? Yeah, I yeah, I, I completely agree. And and if I were in one of those guys' shoes, I'd be like, well, you know, if you weren't a, such a dick all the time and you actually like explained to us <laughs> things and actually like you know developed coaches like you know other great coaches have like you know Mike Shanahan or Bill Walsh who took you know developing talent. Um, you know, very seriously, you know, Mike Holmgren and, and Green Bay, like all those guys like viewed like part of their job was to develop people that they could go out and have like a successful tree and stuff like that. Instead, Bill, you just crapped on us. You know, you treated us like uh, like fungus, like, you know, you kept us in the dark and fed us <laughs> shit. And like, look what happened. <laughs> all right, let's get to uh, Robert Kraft. You're pretty critical of uh of robert yesterday when you wrote about this column at espn why were you so critical greg because i'm i'm just i'm i'm sick of it i'm sick of like all this bickering back and forth the neediness the want the egos like all this stuff like you know it's and i just think i think crafts on like a huge l Like he's, and I even think Bill Simmons tweeted this today. Like, you know, it's been like a year and I I completely agree with him. I'm trying to uh, find out, you know, exactly where I wrote this. Oh, I was like, you know, um, you know, starting with, first of all, they, they, they entertain, this was a shock to me in this because I always, and, and this is another piece of my reporting that some people have crapped on that didn't believe. When I said at the end of last year, it's not assured that Bill's back. And again, they report, but this time it's Robert Kraft wanted to fire Bill Belichick, but Jonathan Kraft saved the job. I'm pretty sure Wickersham and those guys, were, or Wickersham, when he wrote sort of the end of days for Bill Belichick, reported the opposite that it was Jonathan who wanted to shit can Bill, but Robert. Uh, kept him out of it but you know you don't do that you bring in the billy o'brien thing you do the gerard mayo contract language that basically kneecapped belichick's authority inside the building that basically led to a dysfunctional season that was a complete outlier from any other time in belichick's career here or otherwise where you know they underperformed um, where they were. And to me, that had to do with the dysfunction on the coaching staff, which 
to me was a direct result of Gerard's Mayo uh, contract. They rushed out the dynasty in an obvious attempt for Kraft's Hall of Fame chances to improve it. It was it was bad timing. I railed against it after the first episode where everybody was like, this is awesome. This, and I was just like, no, this isn't fair to Bill. And, um, you know, playing dumb about the NFL PA grades, not giving Elliot Wolf a, a real title and a contract. And now they're bad mouthing Belichick, you know, along with the, the, the lighthouse and, and all that while they're getting poor NFL PA grades. Like, and now they're bad mouth, mouthing Bill behind the scenes where they should just be like, look, go talk to, go talk to other people. Like, go talk to Josh McDaniels, anybody who's worked for Bill, who's go talk to Billy O'Brien. You want to know about Bill? We're, go talk to them. And, like, I'm just, I'm tired of it. Um, this is similar to uh, Kraft and Belichick after Brady left. Um, it's just, like, it's time to move on. Bill's out of the building. Just, like, move on. Let him live his life. Don't trash him in a documentary. And, to ownership so he can't get a job like if he wants to coach and he's still a really great coach like i'm i'm just i'm just tired of it here's what i'll say and and i agree with most of what you just said greg i I agree with a lot of what you just said and you can throw in the patriots super bowl video that came out in january where all of a sudden belichick was nowhere to be found i think (laughs) i think they had they had a close up of his hand holding the Lombardi trophy, but you didn't see Belichick <laughs> at all during like the two and a half, three minute video, whatever it was. That, that's so petty. It's ridiculous. That petty, 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 petty. No doubt about that. I agree with what most of what you just said. I will say the Arthur Blank thing is pretty tough. And the reason why you know, I went through this on my podcast, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the gist. But the relationships matter. And so with, with Blank and Kraft, that was a that's a very difficult position for Robert to be in because Blank is a very close friend of his. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you think about ownership and and the owners in the league and they're close friends. So, you know, if you put yourself in that spot of craft, I don't know if he was going out of his way to ruin Belichick's chances of getting that job more so than just being honest with one of his closest friends. And it, and people would say, well, wh- why couldn't you, you know, try to dance around it? Because if you dance around it and and Belichick comes in, Blank's going to be pissed at Kraft because he's going to say, wait a minute, you had an opportunity, Robert, to tell me. We, we tell each other everything. We're close friends. Like, we're friends, man. Like, this goes beyond this. This goes beyond football when it when it's Blank and Kraft, okay? Like, we'll just leave it at that. It goes beyond football. These guys are, are pretty close. So, like, when you – when you're in that spot and you're, you, you got to be a reference. Kraft was in a very difficult rock and a hard place. He had the guy who just worked for him for almost 25 years that won six Super Bowls, but personally they didn't get along and, and he didn't love how Belichick handled things towards the end of his tenure here. And now he's got his closest friend in the NFL ownership wise asking him, what do you think about that guy? If Kraft dismisses it and doesn't answer the question, it's a red flag. If he if he misleads blank, now he's misleading his closest friend. If yeah. you know what I'm so if he if he buries Belichick, he's burying Belichick. So in that specific case, I don't know if he had a good way out of it. Honestly. I, I don't know if he had a good way out of that. Uh, I, I would also say, I kind of wanted your thoughts before we go here on this. Andrew Callahan highlighted the source. And it was it was really weird because in the story, it's there was a source who talked to two sources, and then the original source got back to the writers. And the way it was deemed was this source spoke to, you know, a close friend of Kraft, spoke to the the longtime Belichick confidant. Like, it just seems like whoever was the main source of the Kraft-Belichick stuff is in good graces with both guys. And I was was just fascinated to try to figure out who that was. And I I don't want to speculate, but... I just wonder what was the connective tissue? There was connective tissue within this sourcing. And I wonder who could play both sides of that fence. It's just fascinating to me. Like who is in that position that is close enough to Kraft, but also close enough to Belichick and feels confident enough that they could speak to each of the other sources to get that information and then leak it 
and then leak it to the writers. Whoever that person is, they got a lot of Gerard Mayo confidence in them because that's, I need that's something that, else. I need that meme where the, the, the guy has all the like, <laughs> I know. like this is, that just made me dizzy. I know it's, it's crazy. I was just thinking about it um, because there, there can't be many people, Greg, there, there can't be many people in that position to speak with authority to these writers. And I'm just trying to pull it up before we go. Cause I want to make it specific, as specific as I can, how it was, how it was written. But uh, it had to do with, you know, the source was, oh, here it is. In a conversation with blank Kraft delivered a stark assessment of Belichick's character. According to a source, who spoke to two people, a close craft friend and a longtime Belichick confidant. So the source who gave the information to the writers was somebody who spoke to a person from each side of the fence, the Belichick fence and the craft fence. There can only be so many people that can do that. Yeah. I, I can't imagine there's a big group of people that can speak to and get and get private information from right i mean mm-hmm. this is somebody who's trusted by both sides so i just i wonder who the connective tissue was I, I would love to know who that person is just love to know dig it up greg go to work i'll go let for us it. know <laughs> he's greg i'm nick everybody enjoy your weekend we're back next week big week it's officially draft week it's going Thank to God. be here we've been talking about it forever uh until then be well it's the greg bedard patriots podcast with nick Cap.